All right, so um, topic 10 is on, that's, all right, the way this class was designed by the ones who started it, top 10 was the final chapter. But then they had all the stuff they left out. That becomes topic 11. So that's next week. Um, topic 10 is, since it was the last lesson, it was on the last things, on, on uh, uh, death and eternal life type stuff. Um, however, their handout, I. I had some parts I did not uh, like at all, what the, uh, the way they phrased things. So I substituted from another adult confirmation series. <laughs> uh, last thing, so th that's that's why this seems different. Yes? I was thinking, you're talking about aging. Uh, well, I mean, I went through this originally. When we messed the class, we made it up on cassette tape. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, we have it on <laughs> well, our, our, our YouTube <laughs> channel, and you can watch us live, yeah. <laughs> Well, not live, I'm saying. Uh, we can only live stream one event because uh, we don't have enough bandwidth. Does that sound like the right word to use? I, I, it's a little more than my technical knowledge here. But um, so we can only live stream one thing at a time so that we live stream the Sanctuary Bible Study. This is recorded and posted later in the afternoon, I guess. Is when it's posted. Well, just so we get it, I don't care what Yeah, no, that's, I, I'm just excited about it. All right, so we're talking about death and dying, and if you look on the back side of the first sheet, this one has all the scripture verses listed. This is kind of like our catechisms, uh, because it gives a question, and then it gives scripture answers, and then it has a summary thing. So we're, we won't look at every part of the scriptures under it, but um, just the ones I most want to emphasize. By the way, so this is yours to keep, that means, so I will expect you to read the rest of the scriptures on but what should my attitude and preparation be toward death? And, and notice that first one from Psalm 90, the length of our days is 70 years or 80, if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Now, I probably disagreed with that statement originally. Um, they quickly pass. You know, when, when you're a young person, time goes so slow, it seems like. Um, but the older I get, you know, it's like summer, now over, but I, I kind of still waiting for summer to happen, you know, and it, but it's already gone. And, you know, it, it seems like I just celebrated a birthday, and then another birthday comes, and it seems like we just had Christmas, and yet it's here again. So, um, quickly passes. So then, look at the dot, first dotted one, John 11. This is um, the key for preparing for death. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. By the way, that goes on, and whoever lives and believes in me will never truly die. That's why we're not afraid of death. It's interesting, I have some friends of mine that I grew up with that would never go to a funeral, would never go to a funeral home, would not go to a nursing home, and would not go to visit someone in the hospital. Why? Yeah, death, right? yeah, death scared them that bad. You know, and I'm going to tell you, you don't go to visit someone who's dying in the, in the nursing home or in the hospital or in hospice for your sake. You go for theirs. But it just kind of bothers me that they couldn't go beyond themselves and their own feelings to think about what they could do for someone else. Uh, because I'm going to tell you, a lot of times that People who are ready to go to heaven wait until they get to say goodbye to everyone that they want to, that's close to them. I've seen that happen many times. They're like a, a grandmother waits for the last of her grandchildren to get there. He says goodbye the next day she passes away. And, and I think there's a certain element of will, you know, that no, we fight for life until we're ready to go. Um, but for us, death is not a scary thing. Um, for me, um, death is like, uh, walking uh, into the door of the joy room when I know there's a birthday party being held for me there. You know, woo, yeah, I mean, this is something exciting. And, and you think of the people that will greet you there, and you think of the gift of Christ himself who will join us there. Hello there. We're on the back side of that first page. So, um, so we're not afraid of death. And then look at Psalm 23. That's my, that's my all-time favorite psalm to use for anything almost. Whenever I'm doing any sort of visitation, 23rd Psalm just works so well. 
But uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That's why we're not afraid. Jesus takes our hand. He walks us right through death. You know? um, and then the, the last part of that, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the confidence we have. We will dwell in God's house forever. We don't have to be afraid of anything. Um, so there's kind of two views of death in today's world. One is that death is not the end. There's life after death. That's, of course, Christian view. What's the other view? It's all over. Circle of life. That's the Disney view of death. What do I mean by circle of life? Reborn. You die. What happens to you? You uh, not reincarnated. You decay, and then earthworms eat your remains, and then they're eaten by birds, and then you know, <laughs> or they become fertilizer for the grass, and then the grass is eaten by a squirrel. Who eats grass? A cow, <laughs> you know. And in a circle of life, because your remains become part of the circle of life. Now I have to tell you, I don't find a lot of comfort in knowing that a worm's going to use my body for nourishment. <laughs> I much prefer our Christian hope. So, by the way, and I'm not following order on this at all, is that just a, a pipe dream, as we used to call it? You know, um, just a fairy tale, this life after death stuff? No, no that, that is reality. So how do we know that? Now, we say from Scripture, and that settles it for us, but if, if I'm talking to someone else, not a believer, how would I justify, defend my faith in the afterlife and life after death. I don't know. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, one, for Christians, we point to the resurrection of Jesus. The fact that he overcame death proves that there is life after death. But it also, I like to get people disarmed a little bit, so you have to use um, kind of reason um, a little bit. So what I like to do is point to near-death experiences. Um, and for example, uh, uh, I read a book by an anesthesiologist who um, was there when many times when people woke up um, after surgery, uh, and including some of the people whose hearts stopped on, you know, and they had to be redone and all that stuff. So, um, and he told about case after case of people who saw something after death. And by the way, he had two different categories of people who saw stuff. What were they? Goodbye. Yeah, one was the white, the, the tunnel of light, and you go in there, and it's a feeling of warmth and peace and love. And, you, and then as you're going up this tunnel of light, you see your loved ones and friends who went before you. Um, so that's very common. But he said there were also people who woke up and were terrified because they, they saw it was a place of pain and torture. Um, and he said most of those people if you, if would, would tell you what they saw right at that moment they wake up. But if you talk to him about it the next day, because he'd go back and want to find out more, they, they would say they didn't remember it. And they probably didn't. Because it's, sometimes things are too horrifying to remember or else they just don't want to talk about it. But have any of you known someone who said, uh, well, there was uh, Mr. Hess, I can't think of his first name. So he was a, a farmer up in Michigan that was a member of the church, and he only told me and one other person, but when, when he was having sur heart surgery, I think he's having like three bypass or something, his heart stopped, and, um, but he said he saw stuff. And he said, I'm not gonna tell anybody else because they're gonna think I'm crazy. I said, that's not crazy. God gave you a glimpse what was to be so that you wouldn't be afraid. So that even though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. Um, who had a near-death experience in the Bible? Ooh, I'm pushing you. So Stephen, the first of the Christian martyrs in the book of Acts, you remember, he looks up and he sees Jesus at the right hand of God and, uh, and different other little things. But what was that? He was about to die a painful death, right? He was about to be stoned to death by a, a, you know, a rabid crowd. But was he afraid at all? No, he knew what awaited him. I mean, it's, it was really, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so I think the descriptions of heaven in the Bible are given to us 
so we're not afraid. And, and that's a cool thing. All right, now we'll go back to the way I'm supposed to be teaching. Um, so what happens at death? So look at that. Uh, this is um, question two. And at the bottom of the page, it says page 113, which means nothing for us. But um, that just so you find it. What happens at death? In the first verse, the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. So there's a separation that takes place when a human being dies. What is the separation? Body and spirit. Yeah, body and spirit or body and soul, whatever words you want to use. So body is laid to rest here. I mean, that's what the, the committal service is about in the, the cemetery. But that's not the person. The person has already been raised. So um, spirit returns to the God who gave it. Um, yeah, and look at uh, that dotted one, Luke 23. Jesus answered the criminal. This is the guy on the, on the cross beside him. Remember, two criminals. Um, both were what we would call uh, muggers. You know, that's what I guess what we call them today because they beat people up and then took all their stuff, usually including their clothing because clothing was very hard to make back then. They didn't have factories in Indonesia or China that would do that. Vietnam, where else, uh, you know. Um, so it was very expensive. So they'd take everything and leave them. They'd beat them up, take their stuff. Some of them died. These guys were vulgar, evil people. You know, when you're beating up, say, elderly people and taking all their stuff, Not, you know. Um, but that one turns to Jesus and asks, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this is what Jesus said. I tell you the truth, today, this very day, you'll be with me in paradise. So his soul, that day, by the way, he was not a nice guy. But he still was promised heaven. Why? He believed. Because he looked to Jesus Christ in faith. Um, you will not get into heaven because you're such wonderful people. I do think you're wonderful people, don't get me wrong. But we're not that wonderful. You know, not, we're not getting into heaven based on how wonderful we are. We get in by grace same way he did. But I, I had someone say, I don't like that. Oh, um, convicted mass murderer. I had an interview with a reporter once, and, and he confessed faith in Jesus Christ. And he, he told his lawyers not to appeal for the death penalty. He said, I deserve to die. And so just before he was going to, the day before he was going to be put to death, he said, I deserve to die, but I know that I'll live in heaven. And um, so I, I talked about that. This is a lot of years ago um, up in Michigan. And he, uh, I had a person get mad at me. I don't, yeah, no one like that should ever be in heaven. Well, you know what? If he can't make it, I can't either. Because I'm no better than he is. What are the different ways we can kill people? Thoughts. Thought, words, and deeds. Uh, you know, and, uh, and I'm going to tell you, when, when we stay mad at someone, when we ish, wish evil upon someone, that's a form of murder according to Jesus. So I, I am a mass murderer according to Jesus' definition. Uh, remember, uh, Jimmy Carter got in trouble because uh, they asked him if he'd ever committed adultery. And he gave a good biblical answer. He said, well, no, but I've cheated on my wife in my heart. You know, I can, or something like that. And it, yeah, you know, and, and that is a correct biblical answer. The media went wild with it. But by the way, I wish our, all our politicians today... <laughs> Word like that, Jimmy Carter in that aspect, because, yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to go anymore. Um, but the, the the main point is, when we die, we we will go to heaven if we look to Jesus Christ in faith. Doesn't matter how good or bad we are, what matters is faith. Now, because of faith, we want to live righteous lives that bring glory to God's name. But don't ever think. Yeah, I'm a lot better than most people. That's why I'm going to get into heaven. No, no one gets into heaven. Um, by the way, look at that last verse under that section. Um, he, Jesus, went and preached to the spirits in prison. Um, this is the line in the creed. Remember, he descended into hell. <clears throat> That's based on this. So what is this referring to? Those who do not believe. Where do they go? Instantly to hell. And uh, we have a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the concept of hell. I'm uncomfortable with hell. I don't want anyone to go there. You know, that's why we try to share a faith with everyone we possibly can. But just because we're uncomfortable with it doesn't mean it's not real. Um, who, who was hell prepared for? 
And this is all coming up. I'm just jumping around on this. So. The devil and the angels? Yeah, fallen angels. Satan and his fallen angels. Um, God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. That's why he sent his only son to die on a miserable cross. That's how much God wants no one to be in hell. All right, yeah, interesting stuff. What they said at death's door. Um, so the first two are what they call on the author of this infidels. What's an infidel? What do you think? Non-believer. Yeah, non-believer, but it's kind of a defiant non-believer. And in your face, proud of being a non-believer, wants to mock Christianity. Um, so Thomas Paine, who was a, that's Revolutionary War time and famous, good guy in terms of the American Revolution, bad guy in terms of theology. So, But look at what he said at death. I would give worlds if I had them that the age of reason, he, he, he poo-pawed the idea of God and uh, heaven and hell and all that stuff. He said none of that stuff is real. Um, so this is what he's saying when he dies. I would give worlds if I had them that the age of reason had never been published. Oh God, what have I done to suffer so much? But there is no God. But if there should be, what will become of me after, hereafter? Stay with me for God's sake. Send even a child to stay with me, for it's hell to be alone. If ever the devil had an agent, I have been that one. So what was he going through as he faced imminent death? Agony. I mean, he is in agony. And see, there's a part of him we, in, deep in our hearts, we have a natural knowledge of God. That's what the book of Romans says. We know there is a God, and we know we haven't measured up. That's deep in our hearts. And he pretended for all those years, no, nah, none of that's true. But as he faces death, he faces that realization, this was all true. And by the way, if he would have turned to Christ at that moment, still would have made it into hell. But when you don't believe, death is a scary thing. Or look at Francis Voltaire, French infidel. Now, I am abandoned by God and man. I'll give you half of what I'm worth if you give me six months' life. Then I shall go to hell and you will go with me. Oh, Christ, oh, Jesus Christ. And again, you notice the, the hopeless feelings and the agony. Now, contrast that with Dwight Moody, um, Moody Bible College, um, oh, Moody Publishing House, all kinds of stuff. Um, boy, there's volumes of his sermons that are still published, I think. You can find them everywhere. But uh, um, he, he said as, as he was dying, I see earth receding, heaven is opening, God is calling. Do you think he was afraid? Yeah, that's and, and it sure sounds like he had a kind of a near-death experience. God gave him a, a glimpse of heaven. Didn't have to be afraid. And uh, Judson was a missionary, he said, I go with the gladness of a boy bounding away from school. I feel so strong in Christ. Now, I love that image. All right, so I want you to think of the last day of school when you were in like third or fourth grade, okay? Um, Luke's in third grade, right? Yeah. He gets a Bible today, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Got to make sure. Um, but um, what grade is your oldest daughter? Second. Next year, she'll get a Bible in church, okay? Um, I knew she was close, but I couldn't remember for sure. Um, so on the last day of school, back then we got done around Memorial Day, and we had till after Labor Day in Wisconsin school to start. So you had pretty much three months off. And I would be so excited. No school, no schoolwork. Ah, yeah, you know, get to play all day, except for chores. You know, all that stuff. And um, so, and I do not advocate this. I'm very embarrassed at my reckless bad behavior. But we would get all these papers to bring home, and you know what we did with them? We tore them up and threw them in the air. Hallelujah. It's a ticker tape parade as we run home. Literally evil. Don't ever do that. But I'm using that as an illustration of the joy we felt as we departed the school. And um, Judson said that's how he feels as he approaches heaven. Woohoo! Yeah, baby! <laughs> you know? Wow. And there is a huge difference. As a pastor, I've been blessed um, to be with a lot of people when they passed away. And I don't know, there's, there's, it's, to me it's a, it's a sacred time when they breathe their last tear and then open up their eyes looking in the face of Jesus. You know, it's, it's not scary. One time a family had to leave and the funeral home hadn't come yet to pick up the, the body of their loved one. And, uh, and I said, they didn't want to leave the body alone in this hospital room, Fry Hospital. Um, and I said, well, I'll stay with it. 
and uh, one of the nurses came in and said, "Aren't you afraid to be in here with you know that body? It's not gonna hurt me." <laughs> you know, but it's a little weird because you're not used to just you know. I'm, I didn't have conversations or anything, but I I, I read I had my little Bible with me and I read that, and, uh, but it was very peaceful. But we're afraid of death, not for Christians. No, we celebrate. All right, now we're thinking also on times, what does the Bible say about Christ's second coming? Now I have to tell you, um, there's a line of theology out there right now that says there are three comings of Christ. So Christ came at Christmas, you know, was born of the Virgin Mary. Um, that's first coming. Um, according to them, second coming is what they will call the moment of the rapture. And Christ comes again and takes out of earth what? All who believe in him. Leaving non-believers here. Now, I have to tell you, that's what I believed until I went to the seminary. Why did I believe that? Because the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, I read, made sense to me. Uh, you know, um, But that would be the second coming of Christ. And the third coming of Christ is at the end of time. Now, if you notice a Nicene Creed and Apostle Creed, how many comings of Christ did they have? Two. Christmas. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffering under Pontius Pilate. You know, that was one. And then he comes again at the end of time. So when did this idea that there will be three comings of Christ, when was it that the parts of the church started teaching that? Was that early church, like days right after the apostles? Luther's time, did they teach that? So when was it? 1800s. Yeah, 1800s. And they had a new revelation of what Scripture was actually teaching. And I, and I have to tell you, when people say they have a new understanding of Scripture, oftentimes that scares me, you know. Because uh, well, it's the same Bible that the church has had for all these years. What's this? Um, so what is the rapture? The rapture is the lifting up of those with faith, right? We believe in the rapture, but we don't believe in an early rapture that happens while time on this earth remains. When does the rapture happen? And um, rapture is uh, kind of their term, um, but it's, it's, it's referring to a biblical event described in Thessalonians. So it's, I'm not disagreeing with the idea that believers will be lifted up to meet Christ. Um, so when does that happen? When he comes back at the end of time. So yeah, I mean, but where did this idea come so they studied the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation talks about a thousand year period, right? So when is that thousand year period? They say it's yet to come. Now there's, there's actually many different ways of teaching the thousand years and some are Christ comes before the thousand years and this, they got off, you know. Um, technically we're amillennials. I mean, we don't believe that there's a, a, a thousand year reign of Christ on this physical earth. So when is this thousand year period? We're living. That's the time we're in right now. The time between Christ's first coming and his second coming. That's the time period. And that's what the book of Revelation is describing in great detail. By the way, what's the point of the book of Revelation? Why is it written? What's that? It tells about the end of time, right? Yeah, it tells about the end of time, but it's really designed to give hope to the people who are living in the tribulation, the time of the great tribulation. By the way, you're living. You see that it's the great tribulation every single day when you turn on the news. And I think you know what I'm talking about. We're in it. Um, and, and, you know, the scripture says, uh, and then he will come. And if he didn't come, would anyone survive? Doesn't it feel like our world has fallen apart sometimes? By the way, Paul, when did he think, uh, he thought the world was falling apart? And it kind of was back then. And uh, so he thought Christ's return was at hand. Second come. Luther, um, and you have to, if you study Luther's life, there's great unrest, uh, the rich versus the poor, the workers rebelled, slaughtered, just, you name it. And then the papacy is trying to take control of, well, they had control of all of Europe, but now Europe wants control back. They don't want 
some Italian pope ruling over Germany and Sweden and all those places. And so we got all this going on. It felt like the world was falling apart and Luther thought, surely the Lord has to be coming soon. Now I look at our world and it seems to be falling all to pieces and I say, surely Jesus has to be coming soon. I think we always should live with an expectation that Christ's return is at hand. It may happen soon. Now then again, I'm not a date setter. Could be another thousand, two thousand, three. I don't know how long. But if I live as though this were the end times, why is that an advantage to me? One, I'm going to stay in the faith. And two, I'm going to do what is most important while we wait. Which, what is most important besides us personally staying in the faith? Bringing other people. Yeah, bringing other people too. So, you know, if, if Christ, let's say I knew the date Christ was coming and it was uh, 2,000 years from now. Which, by the way, the apostles had great urgency in sharing the faith because they didn't think it would be long. And because they had great urgency, the gospel spread. Man, at a rate that's unbelievable when you think about it. Because if we start with just a handful of believers when the book of Acts starts. And even by the end of the book of Acts, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of believers. You know? And then the Roman Empire kind of converts as a whole. I'm not sure all those were genuine believers, but, you know, people were introduced to Christ. And where Christians had been persecuted, the Colosseum then became a place where the gospel is proclaimed. In fact, when you go there today, you can still see the remnants of the seven stations of the cross that they did each year um, right before Easter there. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But so they had urgency because Christ is coming back soon. We got to share it now. And if I think Christ is coming back in 2,000 years, I'm going to do nothing because that's easier. And it's no stress. You know, what difference does it make? It don't matter. Um, so anyway, second coming, uh, he will come. What does he do when he comes? Boy, I'm really not following the order. We're covering good stuff. Though. What, what will happen when he comes? So one, there's a separation that takes place. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. What's the separation? Sheep and goats. So I was on an island in the Caribbean, and we were one of those tours, you know, where they drive you around, they got a loudspeaker and talk to everyone on the bus or whatever we're on. And they said, uh, out here is uh, uh, a herd of both goats and sheep. And I looked, and all I saw was goats. They all looked like goats to me. Why? There are brands of sheep that do not have the white, fluffy, curly stuff. So he said, and I said, well, how can you tell which one are sheep and which are goats? The tail was different. One had a tail that goes up, the other had a tail that hangs down. And I don't remember which was which. So you have to, any of you know the answer to that? <laughs> you, you know, and so, golly. But so when it talks about, um, you know, Jesus talks about the, you got the sheep and the goats and the, they're separated. They hung out together in, in those areas. But there will be a separation believers and non-believers and believers um, if, if you're around let's say Jesus came five minutes Whew. all right that would be exciting um, what would happen to us well, one we wouldn't have to die right so we would be taken up to meet Christ in the air so I don't think we'll get hurt by the ceiling or anything like that. And I don't think the building will collapse. Well, it will eventually. But, um, you know, we'd be taken up to be with Christ, body and soul. We wouldn't have to die. We wouldn't have to go through that separation. By the way, as we're rising up, look towards the cemetery. This happens in five minutes. What are you going to see as you look towards the cemetery? The bodies of all those who believed and are laid to rest there are going to rise up. Be reunited with the soul, future reunion. And sheep, goats. And the final separation is a sad one for the goats. But not for us. But there's too many goats right now. 
And I'm not talking greatest of all time for those of you who are sports fans. You know, that's a big debate. Who's the greatest of all time? Michael Jordan or who's the other one that's supposed to be? LeBron. LeBron James. By the way, he's, he's no Michael Jordan. I, I know Michael. No, I don't. <laughs> um, but so that's what happens. So then just think, if Christ came back now, we would not have to say goodbye to any of our loved ones again because we'd all be going up to meet him together. Whew, that doesn't sound bad. You know, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, that kingdom come, that's part of what we're praying. Lord, I'm ready any time. And, and what's, what, what would that mean for us if, uh, if we uh, got to rise body and soul to heaven? What would that be the end of for us? Troubles, sickness, pain, stress, sin, being sinned against, etc., etc., etc. I think I could handle that. <laughs> I think that would be good. Um, so, um, how do we know that this is true? So, one, we have Jesus' promise, right? In fact, look at. Uh, so, this is page one fourteen. It says in the bottom, question four. I am fi kind of following this, not really. Um, but um, look at that, uh, the first two verses. John 5, uh, under question four. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear my voice and come out. Now, pretty strong promise. Can Jesus keep that promise? Well, I'm thinking of when Lazarus was in the grave for four days, and Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And lo and behold, the, the dead guy was alive again and walked out of the grave and was unwrapping the grave cloths from around him as he came. And everyone's, you know. Um, plus, uh, when Jesus, uh, at that moment, he died uh, on the cross, what happened? Just a short distance away in a nearby cemetery. Tomb split open. And the bodies of many holy people, that means people who were believers, came back to life. You, you hardly ever hear about this. Should be an Easter sermon. I should do an Easter sermon on just on them. Oh, well, it's got to be about Jesus too. Don't get me wrong. But um, you know what did they do? It said they, they became alive. They they walked out of their uh, tombs, and on Easter, when the news went around that Jesus had risen from the dead, they came into the city and said, "Well, of course Jesus rose from the dead. Look at he brought us back from the dead too." You know, wow. <laughs> But Jesus has proven he can raise people from the dead. That's the, you know. But then look at that second verse, Job 19. I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Um, by the way, what song is based on those words? Especially the first couple of words. I know that my Redeemer lives. And in, in my flesh, I will see him, meaning my body will be raised again, and I will see him in my flesh. Wow. That's pretty good stuff. All right. So we're going to, okay, okay, okay. All right, go to, so we're kind of going to the lesson 20, which starts on page 117, but we're really going to page 118. And, and I'm not going to go too long on the first question, but the first question that is at the bottom of 117, but the answer is at the top of page 118. How does the Bible describe hell? And, and I do not like to overly emphasize this, but I'm just going to read the first couple. Um, so this is uh, Jesus. By the way, this is not a parable, because in, in parables, Jesus doesn't use names. When he uses names, he's telling stories that people would know the people, okay? So in hell, where he, when he, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Father Abraham, and he saw Abraham far away. With, I started to sing Father Abraham, his many sons. <laughs> Father, word father is not in this, but uh, he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, there it is. Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony on, in this fire. I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that he will not also come to this place of torment. Um, do notice, why do I say that's not a parable? Because he mentions Lazarus. And this Lazarus was known. 
So, um, but look at the words that are used to describe hell. Torment, fire, agony, yeah. Or, or look at the next one. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they'll weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They'll throw them into the fiery furnace. That does not sound pleasant. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, weeping we know about. What's gnashing of teeth? When you're in so much pain, either emotional or physical, that you're grinding, you're kind of gritting your teeth, grinding your teeth. Um, you remember sometimes when people had seizures, they worried and they did something. What did they do? Put a stick in their mouth. Yeah, put a stick in their mouth so they, and or cowboy movie. You get shot and they got to dig out the bullet with a dirty, rusty knife. By the way, they should have cleaned it. But you know, and then when, they, but what did they give the guy? Well, yeah, <laughs> a little painkiller. Yeah, hopefully pour a little on the wound, too. But what else do they give? A rag. A rag or a bullet. A bullet. Bite, bite on a bullet. Is that so you don't break your teeth? Although biting on a bullet seems like you break your teeth anyway, so I'm not sure. Cloth makes sense. It's a little more cushiony, but, you know, a stick, softer, you know. But, um, yeah, so gnashing of teeth, like if you're really angry, you know, they, they, we instinctively f make fists, right? But we also instinctively start gritting our teeth and, uh, you know, but that's a sign of emotional distress where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's how. All right, I don't want to go on about that anymore. Um, it's a place I don't want anyone to go. And you know what? Like when I was in high school and middle school and elementary school, um, I was one of the people who got picked on. I used to hate being picked on. Sometimes you don't want to go to school anymore. Nowadays we call it bullying. It was just part of growing up. Any of you ever get picked on at school? Yeah. Well, good. See, you're so beautiful and intelligent and smart, no one would pick on you. Uh, you know, <laughs> they had a lot to pick on in me. But, you know, and, but that kind of agony, you know, it's like, uh, I don't, you know, that's what you feel. You just, you know, you don't even want to see that person again because you know what's coming. And you, and you start curling your fingers and biting your teeth even when you see them turn around the corner. Um, that's a sign of intense agony. Now, but, so I don't want anyone to go there, even my enemies, even those who picked on me in high school. By the way, I'm not mad at them. <laughs> in fact, I, I haven't gone to a reunion for a long time because uh, I've lived out of state for all my adult life. You know, I moved away from home and to go back to visit, but it's not convenient to go to class reunions and stuff. But I did go to one when I was living in Michigan. I'm coming back. And one, I found that people treated me decently, but I still didn't really fit in with anybody there. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't need to go back. Because you know who my best friends always have been? Church. Church family. You know, same values. All right, what will heaven be like? Much more fun. First of all, notice Jesus promised uh, many rooms, meaning there's room for you. Um, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. You know, what is Christ doing while we wait for him to come back? Well, one of the things he's doing is getting everything ready for you. And, and make no of a mistake about it. It's going to be a nice place. You know, um, like if you were coming to our house uh, and you were going to sleep overnight for a couple of days, one, I would need like a week notice. <laughs> Why? Nice. Yeah, you know, because those extra bedrooms, that's where we put all the stuff that when we're just having people in the living room, <laughs> you know, you know, because I'm sure none of you ever do that. Your houses are always immaculate, but, uh, you know, we're kind of human. And by the way, my bedroom, no one will ever see my bedroom because, you know, I've accumulated so much junk and Denise says, you've got to go through that and sort it out. Well, I'm attached to all of it. All of it's of immense importance to me emotionally. All of those 400 t-shirts that I got or whatever, you know. <laughs> So I got a stack that doesn't fit in any of the chest of drawers or the closet, and uh, I guess I should do something about it. But um, he's going to prepare a place. It's going to be a nice place. He's, he's, he's got your name written on it. Uh, notice uh, the second one. Did I turn this on? Ah, uh, this. I never turned this on. I'll just take it off now. <laughs> It'll still pick me up, but it won't be as good. Sorry for those watching online. Uh, Cheryl will still hear me, but she's going to have to turn her volume. Oh, okay. My voice carries. After I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. A lot of people going to be in heaven. The believers of all time. Past, present, future. Um, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Now notice that. 
Uh, when I was uh, living, a vicar, a student pastor in Montana, there was a lot of little cult groups out there, and, and they were branches of Christianity, but they weren't Christian. And one of the things they like to do is say um, black people and Native Americans and Jewish people and this the group and that group, um, they, they weren't going to ever be in heaven. They couldn't be God's people. I mean, it was vulgar, it was filthy, it was, a, it was an awful lie. And, and I resented that that was being said in the name of Christ. And, and you look at this, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. There's going to be a multitude of skin colors and accents and all that stuff. There'll be room for Germans, but we're not the only ones there. You know, let's see, how many of you have German ancestry? So, yeah. What are you? Nichols is... Yeah, German. Yeah, well, and Nichols, so yeah. Yeah, okay. I was thinking that's probably German, but I don't know everything. All right, so um, they were wearing white robes, white symbolizing forgiveness, um, and holding palm branches. Think of Palm Sunday, how excited everyone were, and, you know, praise God. Um, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's cool. Uh, you notice the joy that's there. They went there. Thanks. Yeah. Um, then, and look at the next one. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. How many angels are there? A lot. <laughs> um, how many were there in the beginning? One third more. What happened to the one third? Came the demons. Um, yeah, but angels will be there. And then look at Revelation 7. Um, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. Or look at Revelation 21. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now that's cool. Now I want you to think about that. You know, we worship God. We believe in God. We know he's real. But on a bad day, wouldn't it be nice if you could see him and hear his voice and have him give you a big hug? You know, wow. In heaven, that will happen. By the way, Garden of Eden... Adam and Eve saw God and walked with him, talked with him. You know, the song in the garden, and he walks with me and he talks with me. That's Adam and Eve stuff. It's also what heaven is like. Um, if you really think of it, um, heaven is a restoration of the garden. Everything that was lost is now restored fully. Um, and and um, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. All the things that cause us sadness and frustration are done away with. All will be made new. Yeah. And, and then look at how the end of that quote goes. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He wants you to know absolutely beyond any shadow of doubt, these words are true. And, and you can depend on them. All right. So uh, once we make it to heaven, uh, we will never again die. We won't get sick. Um, how long do we stay in heaven? Forever. Forever. Now, that's a tough concept to understand, isn't it? it? Sounds like a long time. But it won't feel that way in heaven. You ever been at, uh, like, you're having such a good time, and then you look at your watch, and you realize, like, four hours have passed, and it's like, how that can happen? Vacations are like that to me a lot of times, you know. And then, how can, how can it, it can't be Friday already. I gotta go back home tomorrow. Ah! You know, how can that happen? Well, heaven won't feel like a long time. It's eternal joy. Um, now, I did not cover everything in this handout. We're not gonna talk about it next time. So what does that mean? You have to read it, and there's a lot of good stuff. I summarized an awful lot. I tried to get this in because I kept telling you at some point this class will end. Well, next week is when the class will end. We have one more lesson. Uh, Just one more. Yeah, one more week. Um, are you? Is that when you're gone? Or? I'm gone next week and the next week. So. All right. Yeah. So you have homework. You'll have. Yeah. Well, no, you're not through until you watch the last one. Yes, she will. And if not, she doesn't. I'll get you one. You just remind. Me. But you're not through till you watch it, so oh, there sorry. you go. I All right. You. Well, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you for your promise of eternal life. Help us to live knowing that uh, this world is not all that exists. And help us to make good choices in the limited time that we are here. We pray this in your son's name.